Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Same sex marriage is a story that consistently makes headlines in the mainstream media, and for good reason. Five states have legalized same sex marriage, and number six is expected to do so soon. The New York State Assembly passed same sex marriage legislation last week, and the Senate is taking up the issue this week. So, how is ethnic and immigrant media handling this hot button issue? On this edition of Independent Sources, we explore attitudes on homosexuality and gay marriage and the African-American and Muslim communities, and whether these attitudes are reflected in media coverage. We learn why a program that encourages black men to stay in school is getting good press here and in the Caribbean. And we meet some young journalists in the Bronx who report on news they've heard. These stories and news of the week after this. What we try to do with the show, it's it basically to give tools to the Hispanic community for them to live a better life in the United States, whether it fits education, health, uh, immigration, uh, public affairs shows, also culture. We give them every day, you know, from Monday through Friday, different shows that they can uh, participate in and voice their opinions and, and concerns. Two major Spanish language newspapers, El Diario La Prensa and La Opinion, have endorsed same sex marriage. But much of the ethnic and immigrant media has still clear of consistent coverage or commentary on this controversial issue. Is this because there are more pressing issues in these communities, even for gay men and lesbians? Or is the subject just too taboo to tackle? Zafis LeBurn talked about the topic with journalist Kenyon Farrell, who has written about same-sex marriage, and filmmaker Parvez Sharma, who made a documentary about Islam and homosexuality. Kenyon, I want to start the discussion with a question to you. Um, I want to quote from Brian Watson, who is the president of the D.C. Coalition of Black, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Men and Women. And he said... I don't think gay marriage is an issue that blacks and Hispanic people have at the top of their agendas. He feels that there are other underlying issues in the community that need to be addressed um, first before this is put on the, the top of the agenda. Do you think that uh, that's the case? Um, yes, I do think that's the case. I think there's a couple things that happen. I think one is that often, um, I think for a lot of African Americans, that you know, and even for African American, um, you know, lesbian, gay, by transgender folks that um, I talk to in my work, that gay marriage is not the number one issue. For some people, they feel like it might be nice, but there are lots of other um, issues sort of on the table. Thinking, um, you know, about the HIV/AIDS epidemic, which disproportionately impacts Black gay men in particular in the U.S., um, and then issues of violence. I know Human Rights Campaign did um, several surveys of young people a few years ago um, asking about what the issues were for them and for African-American um, LGBT youth, um, issues of violence was the number one issue. And so I think um, that for many of us, um, I think that quote is absolutely correct, that there are other issues on the table. But I will say that I think um, that for many um, of our sort of straight brothers and sisters, right, in the African-American community, I think sometimes that also is a way to sort of not actually deal with homophobia and the, uh, the impact on, you know, LGBT people who are in the community. Now, you mentioned HIV, AIDS, and so forth. There was, there's also a second issue that um, Watson spoke specifically of as regards to equal treatment in the workplace. Do you think that is also another issue that, um, that is kind of under but not really being addressed by in the media right now? Well, I think it's not being addressed in the media. I mean, there's several um, groups, both at the federal level, who are working on, you know, non-discrimination uh, legislation at the federal level to protect um, LGBT folks, and also here in New York State. So there's the gender um, bill, which is uh, happening in New York State, that specifically adds gender identity um, discrimination to the existing um, you know, non-discrimination legal framework. So, um, but those issues don't um, seem to, uh, you know, get a lot of the attention that gay marriage does when, in fact, in about 30 states, I believe, you can still be fired um, in the U.S. if you are, uh, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Mm -hmm. Now, Professor, to you, I know that, you know, several of the underlying issues that, you know, Kenya talked about in the African-American community and so forth, your film, Jihad for Love, um, 
let's talk just a little bit about it um, before we, we get into any kind of conversation. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the, the film itself. Well, the film, um, which took six years to make and has been seen by more than a million people in 35 countries now, is about Islam and homosexuality and follows a group of very religious Muslims in different countries sort of talking about their homosexuality and how irreconcilable it is with their religion. And what Kenyon was saying, I, I think it's really interesting that a voice is coming out of the black community that I think would mirror opinions in the Muslim community, though slightly differently, about gay marriage not particularly being an issue to discuss at all. Now, when you look at Muslims living in the States, you're looking at issues of discrimination, racial profiling, post-September 11th, and this idea that all Muslims, including myself, you know, being gay and Muslim even, uh, we're engaged in defending Islam all the time. So, so the issue of gayness, I have discovered, is actually very much on the back burner. And the discussion of gay marriage, of course, is completely absent. And, and one of the other reasons it's possibly absent in ethnic media is that um, immigrant communities generally tend to be more religious, tend to carry their religious beliefs with them when they move. To, to the states, for example, and definitely true of Muslims living in the states. And, and when you carry that religious belief and the problem that monotheistic religions have with homosexuality, then of course you can't have that discussion. I want to just follow up on something you said, Pervez. I want to quote um, from the Korea Times. There was an article written in uh, four years ago that compared same-sex marriage to a mad cow disease, if you will. And uh, the author, uh, Yonggu, who is a pastor, he wrote, quote, same-sex marriage destroys holy marriage and the cycle of life. It makes humans mad. So I call it mad human disease. Um, Kenyon, do you think that reporters can get their job done when the people that they are re reporting to spit this kind of, spew this kind of venom in, in, in the media, do you think? That well, I think it's um, absolutely up to reporters, and I think it actually makes journalism even more important um, when, you know, you have um, people who, you know, in op-eds or columns can write, you know, those kind of ridiculous statements. So I think it makes um, it even more important for journalists to actually, um, you know, show, you know, the LGBT community, particularly ethnic press, because so much of what gets sort of positioned as gay and lesbian community um, in most cases is like um, kind of upper class, what I always say is well-fed, well-scrubbed, white gays and lesbians, right? And so then there becomes a disconnect, I think, for people of color in our communities who then get positioned as either, um, you know, homosexuality is, you know, really this thing that was imposed by white people, which happens, I think, in a lot of um, particularly immigrant communities are imposed by the West is often the discussion. So I think we, uh, I think journalism has to, um, you know, particularly the ethnic press, has to really begin to sort of tell the stories of, you know, uh, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community um, as it exists in that community. Mm -hmm. Pervez again mentioned something just earlier as regards to the conservativeness um, that's in the African American community and several communities that, you know, religion is such the is such the backbone of. I mean, do you think that, you know, reporters can essentially get get past that? Can can do reporting, you know, under those sort of circumstances? Uh, yes, I think um, too often. I think a lot of the press, especially, I think even the black press and the, the mainstream press. I think both to often um, rely on um, sort of the conservative black church as the black community, right? So how many stories do you see on, you know, any nighttime news, you know, channel about the African American community and there's always a scene in the church, right? And I think the church, the black church is an important institution, but it's not the only one. And, um, and there are lots of people who don't go to church in the African American community for lots of reasons. So I think, you know, we have to do, a journalist have to do a better job of, of you know, sort of showing the community in its complexity and a, and a, a complexity of, I've, I come from uh, the African uh, Methodist Episcopal Church tradition on my mother's side, and, you know, my family, ministers included in my family, are um, completely open and welcoming of LGBT folks um, and don't get caught up in the uh, dogma of a lot of the more conservative, um, you know, viewpoints of, of kind of black evangelical traditions. And that side never gets mm -hmm. shown in the press. Mm -hmm. Now, Pervez, um, just to follow up on something Kenyon said earlier, too, 
In light of the fact that, you know, religion, it's such a construct in these communities, and, you know, faith plays such an important part in, in the life of Muslims, in the life of African Americans, and so forth, um, do you feel like your work um, can help in, the, in a sort of a transition to open up that discussion, to really have it, to, to really kind of dissect the issue? Well, Zyphus, I've, I've, you know, I've traveled to more than 35 countries with the Jihad for Love now, and I've been around the country, and interacted with so many people, been to parts of Europe where gay marriage is really a non-issue, and, and then traveled widely in America where the issue is fundamentally about the Christian church and its opposition, or the Roman Catholic Church, let's say, and its opposition to this institution uh, or this challenge to the institution of heterosexual marriage. And my conclusion, ironically, is a little bit different than the conclusion of my film. And I feel that in our lifetimes, religion and homosexuality are going to have a very hard time coming together. I think they are irreconcilable. In my lifetime, I don't see the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, for example, coming down with a ruling saying that homosexuality is okay. Forget, you know, talking about the idea of gay marriage. And, and I feel that, that, that the discussion of gay marriage perhaps is a very complicated one. There is a lot of dissonance even within the gay community as to how to deal with it. There are people in the Muslim gay community, for example, who would also, looking at the issue of marriage religiously, say that they don't want gay marriage. They might just prefer civil unions and getting the same rights that people get. And, you know, so, so it's very hard to sort of form one standard opinion about um, a very divisive issue. Thank you guys very much. Kenyan Faro, Pavesh Sharma. I know there's so much more we can talk about, but unfortunately, we are out of time. <laughs> Thank you guys again for coming, and we'll be right back after this. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. From the Jewish Forward, homebound Jewish seniors are complaining about the quality of the kosher meals they're receiving from the city. This after the city cut funding for home-delivered meal services. Many of the elderly have decided to switch to non-kosher meals in hopes of receiving larger portions and better food. From the Haitian Times, educators say the Department of Education's model of breaking up large, low-performing high schools into smaller schools is only half the battle. DOE officials have reported evidence of improvement from several of the new small schools, but critics argue that it's more important to invest in improving the lives of disadvantaged children. From the Amsterdam News, Teens in New York can look forward to searching for summer jobs despite the bleak job market. Mayor Bloomberg and Governor Patterson have announced that $29 million of federal funding would go towards youth workforce initiatives. The stimulus fund will save 11,000 jobs and create 8,000 more opportunities for New Yorkers between the ages of 14 and 24. And finally, calling all senior citizens in New York City. A brand new senior helpline has gone live. The Irish Echo reports that Senior Helpline USA is designed to help older citizens dealing with loneliness and isolation. Senior citizens who've been trained on the service will operate the helpline in the New York Irish Center on Long Island. Those are just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to you, Gary. The statistics are staggering. At colleges nationwide, black women far outnumber black men on some campuses, two to one. At CUNY's Medgar Evers College, the disparity is even greater. A program at Medgar Evers called the Black Male Initiative encourages black men to enroll and stay in school. A similar program has been established at the University of the West Indies. Joining me to talk about these partner programs is Tony Best of Carib News. He's been covering this story. And Larry Martin, who works with the Medgar Evers program. Welcome. Well, thank you. Gentlemen, we often don't start a conversation talking about statistics, but in this case, I think the statistics tell the story. In 2000 and 2001, the four-year graduation rate for black male in New York City was 31 percent. Nationwide, college graduation rate for black men in 2003 was 34 percent. New York City census data for 2000 showed that only 55.2 percent of black males had jobs. In 2003, the arrest rate for black males per 100,000 was 18,575, in contrast to white male at 4,480 and Hispanic males 7,607. Clearly, we have a problem here. Larry, can you talk to us a bit about a Medgar Evers program and what, how it's trying to counter this trend? 
Well, first, I thank you for the statistics because um, our, our center, the Male Development and Empowerment Center, is an outgrowth of the thinking and the leadership of our president, Dr. Edison O. Jackson. And years ago, he saw this trend, uh, as, he, as did many others, that there was a crisis with males, particularly black males, uh, not coming to uh, higher education, to college, and not being able to complete that education. So he decided that he was not just going to be a spectator, but he was going to find a way uh, for us to begin to address that, uh, this particular problem. So he created the Male Development and Empowerment Center to increase the enrollment of uh, African American males, uh, to retain them, and to make sure that when they walk out of the door of Megda Ellis, they walk out with a degree. But not only that, uh, he wants to, uh, or he's seeking to make sure that these young men also have or have been inculcated with some values about responsible manhood, about uh, their legacy of leadership, and about their commitment to serve their communities. So we've put together a, uh, a menu of programs to address uh, some of the deficiencies that these young men uh, may bring to the educational experience, as well as trying to uh, identify and train high-performing students so that they can be supported and mentored to be able to give back not only to uh, their communities, but to the young men that are already there at McDevitt's College. Okay. And uh, Tony, what's happening in the Caribbean? The, at the University of West Indies, a similar program is going on. Just let me step back to the statistics that okay. you um, give us uh, nationally and in New York City, that reflects the trend in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, the, if you step back even further, when the University of the West Indies was established in the 1940s, I would say about 90 percent of the students uh, were male. Today, the figure is just what you read. In some cases, uh, it, at the Mona campus of the University of West Indies in Jamaica, where the UWI was started, the figures are more like 70, 30 women. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is probably 66, 34, and in Barbados is probably some, where the KFL campus is located, which is the youngest of the three campuses. It is probably about 60, 40, That's somewhere right. in that general uh, vicinity. It's interesting uh, that the Caribbean would have this problem as well as, uh, as New York, because here in the United States, some of the reasons for this problem uh, cited by experts is racism, the legacy of slavery, uh, lack of male role models. What's going on in the Caribbean? Uh, is it similar there, or is there something that's different about the Caribbean problem? Well, the problem in the Caribbean is reflective in the change also in the education system. Where um, when I went to school in the Caribbean, you had a bifurcated system in that you had your male schools and you had your female schools. Uh, now you have co-educational schools all over the place. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the teachers in the school system, uh, you, you don't find many male teachers. All of my teachers were, were male. Uh, we had the military cadet corps. Uh, which is kind of somewhat similar to what you find at some schools here, the Drum and Bugle Corps, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that was male exclusively. Okay. Okay. Today it is dominated by females. Okay. So you have a, a complete um, change uh, and you're having a, a lack of male role models in the schools. Okay, so the, the problems are similar. Right. Both places. Right. Now, uh, let's talk about the, the issue of what exactly you're doing. I mean, give us a sense of the, the projects in, in terms mm -hmm. of you know, what you do to uh, combat this problem. Right. Well, the edifice for most of our, how we're building our program, are centered around uh, some, some broad uh, concepts. Outreach, uh, mentoring, uh, leadership, uh, guidance, and service. Uh, using these building blocks, we put together um, several programs, one a GED program, a, um, a honor society, an emerging leaders uh, institute, um, uh, tutoring and an advisement system, 
uh, and then of course cultural and educational programming. So all of what, what we're trying to do is to make sure that when a young man comes through the doors of Meg Evers, that he is engaged. And being engaged doesn't mean just, you know, saying, how you doing? Uh, we're glad you're here. But being uh, actively engaged where he's plugged into uh, a mentor or, uh, or a mentoring system and plugged into some programs are going to be able to track him. Because what we don't want to happen is for him, him to get lost in the source, as I like sure. to say. Uh, because that is the, uh, a prescription for failure. Um, so we try our best to make sure that we can uh, engage and track him and, and get him positively involved in uh, one of our uh, uh, what we call affinity groups. We have something called the Men of Megda, which is a general group for the, 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 the average student. Then we have two groups that are uh, G, uh, GPA. Uh, base. That's the mental determination, which is a GPA of 2.5 to 3.3, and then we have the Honor Society, the Pi Eta Kappa Honor Society. Mm -hmm. Tony, uh, why do some of these pro programs uh, transform into uh, the University of the West Indies? Uh, how collaboratively are the two institutions, Medgar Evers and the University of the West Indies, working to combat this problem? Well, the, the about conversation started about three years ago between President Jackson, Edison Jackson, and Medgar, and Nigel Harris, Professor Nigel Harris, who is the equivalent, uh, Dr. Jackson's the equivalent to the Caribbean. Uh, and they're using, in the Caribbean, they're using um, the mentoring aspect of it, where the males are going into the community, and going into the schools, to try to keep the young men off the street and back into the classroom. You see, this is a kind of a new or recent phenomenon for the Caribbean, where the nuts and bolts of upward economic and social mobility have always been education-based. So to see all of these young men now dropping out of, uh, they may finish high school, but they're not going on to college. Uh, at a time when there's a proliferation of tertiary level education. Uh, so uh, people are wringing their hands trying to figure out whether the problem lies in the co-educational school system, where you should go back to your all-male schools, uh, or whether uh, there's something else at work. Interesting. Yeah. Now, Larry, the Chancellor had a task force on this, mm -hmm. and they came back with nine recommendations. Uh, so far, uh, where are we in this process? And how much money was committed to this program? Oh, well, I don't know the exact dollar amount. Uh, I know there was millions that were that was committed uh, coming out of uh, city council, allocated some funds for what is called the Black I think members. it was a couple million dollars. Yes, a couple million. Um, what I should say is that the model for the Black Male Initiative, which is CUNY-Y, is the Male Development Empowerment Center sure. at McDowell's College. Um, we try to um, we, we, we try to operate a, a sort of like a more comprehensive kind of a program, and some of our colleagues throughout the system kind of uh, they, they concentrate on one or two aspects of, of the work. Um, but um, the monies basically go to one at Mega Evers. We have tried to. Uh, funnel that money into a community-based GED program, and on the other side, uh, try to use the, the, the funding to, to do the kind of internal uh, outreach and, and program development for our, for our students on, on campus. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for, but we'll continue to follow these programs. Tony Bess of Carib News and Larry Martin of Medgar Evers, thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. We'll be right back. Have you heard the news? In the Bronx, there's a new crop of reporters, high school students, adding a valuable voice to news coverage of the borough. It's all in the pages of Bronx Youth Earned. We end our show with this report from producer Michelle Garcia. Leroy, good to see you. All right. The principal's office. The very thought can strike fear in a student. But this time, it's the student who's asking the questions. When you gave out that note to all the students in the school, 
you know, they thought, you know, like, tuition is going up because of because the archdiocese is making, you know, the schools independent. Leroy Solomon Day might be a student, but he's also a reporter on a story, asking questions students and teachers want to know. You said that the transfer rate out is going to decrease and the transfer rate in is going to increase. Could you, you know, explain on that? Leroy's reporting a story about the fate of his school, Cardinal Spellman High School in the Bronx. And my friends are talking, saying, oh, I'm going to have to transfer out because the tuition's going up. You know, I was like, I got to find out more about this, see if this is really the case. Leroy's story and articles by teens from other Bronx high schools is the heart of the pages of community newspaper Bronx Youth Heard. With the Bronx as their beat, the young people are challenged to look at their home with a reporter's eye. Discover uh, on your own, report extensively. Um, For six the weeks, these cub incident. reporters learn and practice the tricks of the journalism trade. Bronx Youth Heard is a project funded by a grant by the New York Foundation. Their newsroom is housed at the Mount Hope Housing Corporation. Our goal too is, is to help you guys get um, experience different kinds of like reporting. You know. It's hands-on training with real life expectations by working journalists, editors of Bronx community newspapers. You know, we're teaching them reporting and writing the basics of journalism, but we're also giving them a voice in their own communities. We're putting their stories in a paper that's read by, you know, their parents, their teachers, policemen, you know, politicians even, you know, the adults that may, maybe don't always uh, and always notice children as much as, as they should do. One of the first students in the first cl classes wrote, wrote about um, kind of anti-gay sentiment in her school. Um, and, and she interviewed the students ab about it, even the ones who like she felt were um, expressing things that she didn't agree with. She sat down with them and like um, spoke with them. That's, you know, that's um, something that would, would be really hard for us to do. Thursday night or Friday, you'd start checking the story. They're encouraged by role models, including the New York Times' David Gonzalez. You know, I've kind of always been fascinated by this borough. You know, we live in one of the most misunderstood boroughs in the world. Chelsea Bocogno is listening intently. She's onto a story she thinks does just that, gets to community concerns. It's about a fire that occurred two weeks ago on Westchester Square, and it's under one roof, all these places, a nail salon, a pizza shop, a barber shop, they all burned down. I'm going to focus on how it impacted the people of the businesses, the people who went to the businesses, if they're going to reopen the same businesses there, if they're going to relocate. Chelsea admits that she's not too keen on reading the news, a sign of the struggling times for newspapers, which might not bode well for the future of these fledgling journalists. Hopefully by the time they um, get out of college, the new paradigm will be more clear. You know, sooner th than that, we are going to have these students um, come back and we're, we're intern for us. Um, and we're going to stay in touch with them. And really, um, community news is really, I think, as vibrant as it ever. And to cover community, he says, that means covering people of all ages. For Independent Sources, I'm Michelle Garcia. That's our show. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, be independent-minded.